Hi everyone, thank you all for joining us for our webinar on the front lines, surviving the trenches and onto a new mission to combat stigma with Major General Greg Martin, US Army retired. I'd like to remind everyone watching that we will have a 30 minute Q&A. If you're attending through Zoom, you can type in your questions in the chat box. And if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube Live, you can leave a comment to have your question asked and answered. Now I'm so excited to, and honored to introduce our guest today Major General Greg Martin, U.S. Army retired. Greg is a 36 year combat veteran, retired two star general, an airborne ranger, engineer, qualified soldier, army strategist, and proud bipolar survivor. He holds a PhD and two master's degrees from MIT and a bachelor's degree from West Point. He commanded an engineer company battalion, the 130th Engineer Brigade in combat during the first year of the Iraq War and served multiple overseas tours. He was the president of the National Defense University and awarded the Distinguished Service Medal twice, the Bronze Star Medal and the Combat Action Badge. Greg is the father of three sons and now lives in Cocoa Beach, Florida where his, with his wife, where he is writing articles and a book and sharing his story of battling bipolar disorder to stop the stigma and help save lives. Please join me in welcoming Major General Greg Martin. Thank you, Micah. It's really an honor and a privilege to be on this webinar. And I love what you're doing at the International Bipolar Foundation. What a great organization. So thanks. Um, I grew up in Holbrook, Massachusetts near Boston. I was very happy, healthy and successful, but I didn't realize until this year that I actually was hyperthymic, which is a form of mental illness that is basically a, a baseline of mild mania. From my teenage years up until I was age 47 as a colonel in the Iraq war. What hyperthymia, the, the uh, symptoms of it are really extraordinary levels of energy, enthusiasm, drive, um, extroversion, creativity, all the things that made me uh, very, very successful in high, high school and college and as an army officer. The only problem with hyperthymia, it actually gives you an advantage until it doesn't anymore. It, and what, what I mean by that is people who have a hyperthymic personality, which also includes two former presidents, John Kennedy and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, it's an advantage, but it puts you at greater risk for bipolar, mania, anxiety, depression, all the, all the bad things. So I did not know I had it. I just recently learned about this concept reading a fantastic book called The First Rate Madness uncovering the links between leadership and mental illness by uh, Dr. Nasir Gami, and his last name is G-H-A-E-M-I. Uh, he is a professor of psychiatry at Tufts University Medical School and also Harvard Medical School. So he actually really subscribes to this as a form of mild mental illness. And the, the equivalent of hyperthymia, which is sort of the mildly manic personality is dysthymia, which is a continuous baseline state of mild depression. So anyway, my life was great. I was very successful, but my enthusiasm and mild mania grew and grew and grew until I was in the Iraq war in 2003, where I was a brigade commander as a full colonel, uh, leading thousands of troops in the Iraq war the stress of the danger and the excitement of combat, I didn't realize it at the time, but it triggered my genetic predisposition for bipolar. And I was very, very fortunate that most of my mania, most of my time in Iraq, I had a form of high performing mania. So I did, it, it actually helped me. I was utterly fearless. I felt like Superman. I didn't need hardly any sleep. I, I was just, uh, really in a completely other another zone of human performance. Um, I was euphoric, I was happy, I was full of joy. My mind was incredibly sharp. I was all over the battlefield in Iraq and our brigade did ex exceptionally well um, in, in the first year of the war. But what happened is when I got back to Germany, we redeployed after a year and the thrill and the rush and the adrenaline of combat was no longer there. What my brain did is, so when I went into mania, my brain 
produced and distributed an overabundance of dopamine and endorphins and you know, radically changed the biochemistry of my brain and gave me the mania. But when I went back to Germany, it did just the opposite. It underproduced those key chemicals and I fell into depression. Um, I reported my depression, but because I was suicidal, the, uh, the medical people said, you're fine, nothing wrong. And if I had known that I, I had bipolar, I would have realized that I had just undergone my first up, down, full manic depressive cycle. The depression was really, really tough, but it wasn't crippling. And what saved me was the, um, the structure of army life. I mean, I was the brigade commander. I had to get up and go to work. I had to go to physical training. I had to be at the meetings and so on and so forth. And so I just kept putting one foot in front of the other one day at a time. And I somehow managed to struggle my way through about 10 months of depression. And then suddenly it just lifted, poof, I felt good again. Um, my hyper, hyperthymia came back and I felt like the old Greg and it was wonderful. But what happened over the next decade was that my bipolar started going into higher levels of mania, lower levels of depression and my swings just went higher and lower. And then I started being accompanied by psychosis uh, delusions and hallucinations. The entire time I had this, you know, severely worsening bipolar, it was unknown to me or anybody else. It was undetected. It was undiagnosed. Um, we can talk maybe in the Q&A about why, how could it be that I went undiagnosed and unknown for, you know, essentially 11 years. But by 2014, my mania went into uh, an acute state. And I was so disruptive, over the top, uh, eccentric, erratic, that people, you know, hundreds of anonymous complaints went into my boss, who happened to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the highest ranking military officer in the country, uh, General Marty Dempsey. And Dempsey and I had worked together for almost 20 years, and we had a great relationship. And so he was so alarmed by these reports coming in that were so out of character for me. He did three different assessments to get an objective, unbiased look at me and my performance and what was going on. And at that time, I was the president of the National Defense University, which is the highest level um, educational institution in the Department of Defense. Anyway, the reports came back to General Dempsey and they were damning. And all of the reports said, man, Martin has lost it. He's literally gone mad. He's, he's lost his mind. And they recommended that General Dempsey remove me from my command position. So the middle of July, I got a call, report to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff over in the Pentagon. So off I went and I was so high, so manic. I didn't know whether he was gonna promote me, relieve me, I had no idea. But I went into his office and it's a re really, really nice office, all these old famous paintings. And he, he came across the room and he hugged me he said, Greg, I love you like a brother. You've done an amazing job these past two years. No one could have done as much as you did to transform the university, but your time at NDU is over. You have until 5 p.m. today to resign in writing or I will fire you. What are your questions? You would think I would have been disappointed, distraught, hurt, you know, in pain, but I was so manic. I had such, I was in such a state of grandiosity and religiosity and, you know, all that stuff that goes with mania that I said, well, thank you, sir. That's wonderful because I'm going to get a new mission handed down to me from God and then I'm going to go do even greater things. And I gave him a great big hug which is not unusual for someone in that high of a level of mania. But what goes up must come down. And that is a law of gravity with bipolar disorder. So I was as high as a rocket ship, but the rocket ship blew up over Washington, DC. And I came crashing down to earth in a thousand pieces of burning debris. So I spun, slowly at first and then rapidly and then crashed 
into severe, hopeless, crippling depression where I couldn't function, I couldn't think, I had a hard time speaking, I could do almost nothing. I was still on active duty in the army, but I, I was in such bad shape. I was finally at that point diagnosed. Oh yeah, and General Dempsey said, I'm ordering you to go get a psychiatric evaluation. So in July of 2014, I did, and they evaluated me three times and said, you're fine, there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, you know, you're fit for duty. Uh, we see no limitations on your duty performance. And that's not unusual for bipolar because you're not high as a kite all the time. You only are some of the time. And so when I was with these different doctors, we had perfectly reasonable, rational, intelligent, high level discussions about me and my life. And they came away saying, this guy's fine. Unfortunately, the doctors never reached to my military commanders to find out, well, why did you relieve him? What's the problem? And the, uh, the military people never reached to the doctors and said, hey, we're not trying to bias your evaluation, but here's what we've seen with Greg Martin. And you need to know this so you can make a fair, um, reasonable assessment. So they never talked to each other. And so I was diagnosed as being fine. In one of the assessments where my wife Maggie went with me, she said, you know, I think he's manic. And they took the note, but they didn't do anything with it. Four months later, when I was in crippled, hopeless depression, they connected the dots and said, aha, yeah, tell us about the mania. And so then we described it and so on and so forth. They said, oh, you have bipolar disorder, type one, because I was mostly manic, as opposed to type two, which is mostly depressive. And so now I had medical, um, I was medically diagnosed, which was the first time either I or anybody knew what my actual medical mental status was. At the time I said, okay, thank God, I finally know what's wrong with me. Um, and I embraced the pain and I, I said, I wanna do everything I can to get better. Unfortunately, my bipolar and my depression and my psychosis just got worse and worse for more than a year. And in the meantime, I retired from active duty. I moved to New Hampshire where we had a house and I just got steadily worse. Um, I did see a psychiatrist in New Hampshire, but I didn't get better at all, no improvement. Finally, um, a friend, an army battle buddy, as we call them, you know, just a great comrade. He continued to stay in touch with me. He never gave up and he fought to get mine and my wife's attention. And he was living in Pennsylvania, but he helped me get into a really good VA, Veterans Administration Hospital in White River Junction, Vermont. They had an excellent psych psychiatry department. And when I, I was able to get in there on an emergency basis, I went in and saw the psychiatrist and he asked the standard questions. Are you suicidal? No. Do you want to hurt anybody? No. And then he asked a question nobody has asked me before or since. He said, do you have any morbid thoughts of death or dying? And I said, whoa, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. And they dominate my thoughts all the time. It, they're horrible and terrifying. He said, well, tell me what they are. And I said, well, the first one is um, in prison and I am beaten brutally and stabbed to death and I die in a big pool of my own blood. And it's terrifying, it's horrible, and it runs through my mind all the time. The second um, passive suicidal ideation is um, I'm walking down the road and this invisible force grabs me and throws me underneath the wheels of a fast moving 18 wheeler truck. And I'm basically ripped apart and my body parts are thrown everywhere. Um, and he said, whoa, this is really, really serious because these are passive suicidal ideations. And if you don't get help immediately, they could easily transform or morph into active suicidal ideations. And without even ever intending it, you could kill yourself. And you would, your mind would play out these horrible um, images of your own death. So he said, I would really like to keep you in the inpatient psych ward uh, for a while. And I said, good, sounds good. I want to do anything to get better. So I spent, you know, weeks at the VA psych ward, which was a turning point. It was actually a really great experience. I mean, 
the care and the attention and the professionalism that I got at the VA hospital was remarkable. They gave me every kind of treatment, therapy, tried different medicines, did electroconvulsive therapy, spent hours with the chaplain, therapists, and so on and so forth. But I really didn't get better. It, I continued to be depressed. That was in March of 2016. I stayed depressed, terribly depressed. Um, it did help me with the delusions and the psychosis. But finally, in the summer, my wife um, and we did marriage counseling because the bipolar just in, injects so many stresses and problems in your, your personal relationships. And um, my wife called my doctor and said, you got to do something. I can't take this anymore. You have to try some other medication. So I basically went with the doctor and we talked about it and we decided to go with lithium, which is really the ultimate. It's kind of like bringing in the heavy artillery for bipolar. It's the ultimate mood stabilizer. It doesn't work for everybody. Um, and it does have negative side effects, which you have to deal with and manage. But within two to three days of starting on lithium, lithium my depression lifted. And that was in early September, 2016. So it's over five years. I have not had a single bad day. I have not been depressed for one minute. It's what lithium did for me is it put a floor that prevents my mental state from going into depression. It puts a ceiling that prevents my mental state from going into mania. Now I have gone into mild mania. I have had anxiety and agitation and anger, which I've learned how to deal with working with my therapist and my wife. But essentially I recovered, you know, we moved to Cocoa Beach, Florida for the sunshine, the brightness and the warmth. And that has helped me biochemically in my brain, which is a scientific fact that it does. But I launched five years ago on a program of total health and fitness, mind, body, spirit, diet, plenty of water, plenty of sleep, um, avoiding stress, anger, anxiety, agitation. Um, I see my psychiatrist once a quarter, my therapist once a month, um, take my medications religiously every day. I never miss it because I don't want to fall into depression or go into mania again. And I've gotten healthier and healthier. And about a year and a half ago, I just got really, really motivated to start telling my story. And so I wrote the manuscript for a book and I'm in the process of trying to get it published. And I've written, I've had six articles published to include one just came out today. And, and so, uh, and I've got a few more in the works and I've given, you know, dozens and dozens of talks. Um, so my old hyperthymia has come back uh, and I feel like the old Greg Martin pre-bipolar but it's a very healthy hyperthymia. I've got the energy and the enthusiasm. Again, I've got a wonderful network of friends here in Cocoa Beach. My wife and I are happy, healthy. We live. We have a wonderful life. It's just, it's really great. Um, but just a few pieces of, uh, of advice and just some thoughts to close. 100% of the population around the world is either afflicted by mental illness or affected by it with a friend, a family member, a work colleague. You know, some experts say there's one in five people on the planet that have a mental illness. Other experts say it's one in four, which is even more. But I would say, go get help. If, if you know of or you have any mental health issues, um, go get medical help. Um, you got to see medical professionals to deal with it. And that's not a sign of weakness, that's a sign of strength. I would also say, go connect with other people, build connections, because with the interpersonal connections, you're gonna, you're gonna generate hope. And hope is something you need to nourish yourself on because hope will give you that willpower and that strength to get better. And IBPF is really a community of connection and support. I'd remind everybody it's okay to not be okay. And, you know, do your part to chip away at and destroy the diabolical monster of stigma, which is the greatest barrier to help and to hope. Um, you know, my life mission has really become very simple. It's sharing my bipolar story in order to help stop the stigma and save lives. 
And that's, that's really what I do. So with that, uh, I think I've covered a lot of ground that I forgot to time it. Uh, I think it was only about 20 minutes or less. So we have lots of time for questions. You can ask me anything. I mean, any question at all is perfectly fine. And, you know, I'll answer it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Greg. That was, wow, just a, such a powerful experience that you had. And thank you so much for sharing. Um, anyone who has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, I'll give you a couple of seconds for that. And I'll ask my first question. Um, so um, what do you think are the best ways of breaking down the stigma? What have you found that really hits people at home and helps chip away at um, the mental health stigma? Great question. And you've just hit the crux of the mental health suicide problem. Um, I would say first, we need to educate people on the realities of mental illness, mental health, mental health disorders, et cetera. There's a misconception by a lot of people that it's due to a lack of willpower or a lack of character, that people just aren't trying hard enough. And that's completely false. And we know that scientifically. So we need to educate people that it's a real physiological issue and health disorder. that's not make-believe or just made up in people's mind. And then we need to educate them and say, you know, you think that's true of mental illness, but what do you think about cancer or heart disease or diabetes or someone with a broken leg? You think they're just making it up too and it's just a lack of willpower and a lack of character? And they're gonna say, of course not. No, it's real. So then if it's real for cancer, why isn't it just as real for mental illness since we have scientific evidence that that's the case? And so you should do the same thing for someone who's mentally ill that you would do for someone with cancer. You'd say, whoa, I need to get you to see a medical professional. We need to get you diagnosed. We need to get you treated and healed and recovered so you can start living a happy, healthy, successful life again. And then the final piece to the education is, you know, in, in the 1970s, Breast cancer was stigmatized. It was embarrassing. It was shameful. Women didn't talk about it. Their families didn't talk about it. They hid it because they were ashamed because there was a stigma. And First Lady of the United States, Betty Ford, who was President Gerald Ford's wife, she came down with breast cancer. She said, this is illogical. It's medieval. It's ignorant for there to be a stigma. I am gonna help change it. And she went public, told the whole world, I have breast cancer and here's the deal, here's what I'm doing and I'm gonna fight and I'm gonna recover from it. So she was a hero. I mean, she turned breast cancer, and it, it, it took years, decades to change public attitudes, but she was the pioneer and in, in now fighting breast cancer is seen as a heroic cause. People are applauded. I mean, everybody rallies to the support of women who are fighting breast cancer, as they should, because they are. It is a heroic cause. I mean, the NFL, the football players, you'll see them next month. They'll all be wearing pink shoes and pink ribbons and pink hats and shirts and so on and so forth. And that's wonderful. But we need the same attitude in the same campaign for mental illness as exists today for breast cancer. And it took, it took 50 years to reach this state. It didn't happen overnight, but we need to move in that direction. So the, the, the next thing that I would say is people who know about mental illness or have felt the pain, whether they're afflicted themselves or a family member or whatever, don't be intimidated by this stigma. Stand up, tell your story, share your story, speak up. Don't be intimidated by a medieval, cruel, inhumane stigma. And that's what I'm doing. I'm, you know, nobody's gonna tell me that I should be ashamed of having bipolar disorder. I'm proud 
that I, I was able to overcome it and fight through it. And I had friends and family and medical people. And so I think people should share their stories, write articles, give talks, tell their neighbors, their friends. I'm dealing with, you know, with all the articles I've written, I've got, I've had, you know, hundreds of people get a hold of me. And recently I had a, uh, a woman who's a very senior executive professional, incredibly successful. And she had a complete breakdown from bipolar, you know, a number several years ago. It almost cost her life. It almost cost her her career. And, you know, so she reach, reached out to me and said, you know, I'm so impressed that you as a general, you know, are not afraid. You told your story and all that. I said, yeah, you know, if you want to tell yours, I'll work with you. We can co-author articles. We can give talks together. But I said, I'm not pushing you to because you're still a senior executive and I don't want you to risk anything with your job or your image, but when you're ready and you feel like you wanna tell it, I'm, I'm there as your ally and your friend. So those are the main things that I think we can do to combat stigma. Yeah, that was awesome. All of your advice was just like on the point, especially like you are the new, you could be the next, anyone could be the next Miss Ford who is breaking down the stigma of bipolar disorder and helping us um, create awareness and find new people to help. And I especially love that you're bringing in people along the ride and encouraging them to tell their story too. So our first question for the audience. Oh, the only yeah. other thing I'll say is I've had um, dozens and dozens of veterans and I'll just give you a boil down, and this goes to the stigma as well, a boil down version of the story I've heard several dozen times. They went to war, horrific things happened, they got all messed up. You know, depression, bipolar, um, traumatic brain injury, um, PTSD, moral injury, survivor's guilt. They come home, they're a mess. Their marriage falls apart. They're kicked out of the military. They don't have the paperwork to go get care at the VA. They end up losing their job. They're homeless. They become alcoholics. They become drug addicts. One young guy, West Point grad, addic he became addicted to heroin, shooting up. And so then they say, you know, but I, I, I read or I heard your story. And I'm not saying this as a brag, just a fact, how we can break the stigma. And they said, I, I had been afraid didn't want to get help, didn't trust the VA or the doctors. But if you did it in, in your general, then who the heck am I to not do it? So I went and got help and I'm starting to put my life back together. It's a really hard journey, but I'm doing it. I'm going, and I've talked to these guys on the phone. There's a whole bunch of them I keep in touch with. And so I think all of us can have that same effect over our network of other people who are struggling. So whoever you are, you don't have to be a retired general, just tell your story, reach out, build those connections and you can really help people. I just love that message. That's what we're all about here at the International Bipolar Foundation. And that kind of leads in um, to Christina's question. She was wondering how is the military dealing with mental illness in their troops and in their ranks? And what institutions are there to help people there? That's a fantastic question. And I'm in the process of writing a paper about that, how they can do better, things I've learned from my experience. Um, I would say the military is doing a lot. I would say the military has improved significantly since the end of Vietnam, but even more rapidly during the 20 years of the post 9-11 wars. And we're doing much better we have significantly more resources that have gone into it, both in actual mental health care treatment facilities, partnering with the VA, partnering with the private sector. The military has done a, a tremendous job of training and educating the force about the, the realities of mental illness, what it looks like, what are the symptoms of depression, suicidality, bipolar, PTSD and all these other things. So we're, we're doing, the military's doing a lot. 
Um, and we're way better now than we were 20 years ago on 9-11 because the, the two long wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the nature of the wars, repeated deployments by the same people, uh, guerrilla conflict against a very crafty, deadly enemy that uses you know, ambushes and improvised explosive devices and mixing in with the civilian population, you know, that kind of very deadly complex warfare makes a lot of these mental health disorders more frequent and they exacerbate them. So anyway, we're doing better after 20 years of war, but we still need to do better. Um, the stigma still exists. Uh, so we need a top down and a bottom up approach where the senior leaders, who I have a lot of confidence, they really get it, they understand it, and they're trying to do the right things to break down the stigma and make sure that people get the help they need to get well. Um, but we need to do a lot more from the bottom up because a lot of the people coming in from the bottom up are coming in from a society that still has these medieval, ignorant, inhumane attitudes towards mental illness. And so a lot of the younger people who are the primary ones who come down with a mental illness, um, you know, because most of these, you know, like bipolar, it most often strikes between the ages of 18 and 25. So that's where it's mostly the young troops. So we need to do, I think, a more uh, thorough job of educating the younger troops and the younger officers and the younger sergeants about the reality, how to identify it, how to recognize it, and to be empathetic that this is a true military solution. Like we talked about before, is if somebody broke their arm, you'd get a medical help. So if someone's having a psychiatric issue, go get the medical help. Then we need to increase the, the amount in the ready availability of immediate mental health treatment, whether it's you know, a, a licensed clinical social worker, a therapist, somebody that can do that, you know, initial screening and then make a, you know, a triage, whether they need to go to a psychiatrist or get medication or, or what have you. So that needs to be more rapid. We need to figure out how to make it anonymous so that people don't get it put at least immediately in their medical records that could flag, you know, something with mental health that could cause them to have their security uh, um, clearance revoked or to put a ban on their access to firearms. You need to handle the people respectfully and with privacy, at least until you can confirm or deny the state of their mental health. So you don't jump the gun and punish somebody for getting help. That needs some work. That needs to be developed more. You also need to have safe channels of communication. You know, a peer-to-peer -peer support system, you know, private to private or sergeant to sergeant or lieutenant to lieutenant. Those are very, very effective because there's no intimidation involved because they're the same rank. That's, that's good. But what about if you're, you know, a lieutenant and your colonel is exhibiting severe signs of mental illness, kind of like how I was, but nobody really knew what it was and they were afraid to talk to me and they didn't know what they were seeing. You, we need to develop safe channels for lower ranking people. We, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's reasonable to expect a private to go tell a general, hey general, I think you're really displaying mental health problems. I think you need a psychiatrist because you know, based on my training, you're displaying uh, symptoms of bipolar disorder. That's not gonna happen. It, it just isn't because of human nature and the chain of command and people don't wanna put themselves at risk. But those younger people, there should be a safe channel where they should be able to go to another high ranking person and tell them, hey, I'm really seeing issues with General Martin. I mean, here's what I'm saying. I mean, I don't know what's going on, but you know, a safe channel and then that peer to a general or a colonel or a sergeant major, they could have a safe conversation and maybe get the person pointed in the right direction. So those are things that need to happen. But at the end of the day, you know, the military is a high standard, very demanding organization. It's all about deploying, fighting, and winning with dangerous weapons, you know, intelligence that's quite sensitive, 
and, te- and it's going to be built on teams that are high functioning and the people have to be healthy, mind, body, spirit, mentally, et cetera. So in my mind, we have to deal with mental illness without stigmatizing it and scaring people into hiding it. Um, but we also need to be honest and say, there's a level of mental illness that you know you can't serve in a healthful manner in the military because we don't want you to have access to weapons or we don't want you to have access to classified material. And we're gonna separate you medically, but don't feel bad about it because you have a mental illness, but we also separate an infantry soldier who tears his knee up and he can't march or hike or rucksack anymore. So there's no stigma against that guy. He's gonna get his knee fixed and have another career as a civilian doing something else. Um, you know, a paratrooper jumps out of an airplane and you know they have a bad fall and they break their back. They can't serve as a paratrooper anymore. You have to medically separate them. So you have a mental health disorder that makes it prohibitive for you to serve anymore in the US military, but don't feel bad about it. We're gonna help you. We're gonna, we're gonna separate you from the military. We're gonna get you connected with the VA, the Veterans Administration. They're world-class on mental health care. And we're gonna help get you into some training that you can do a whole new career in the civilian world. And they don't care whether you have a, a mental health disorder. So that I, those are some of the things that I think we need to do. And I'm going to cover that in this paper that I'm, I hopefully will have out sometime this month. Awesome. That was so informative. And not only are those just great steps that the military should and need to be taking, but there are also things that translate to civilian life as well. Like we just all need to be more empathetic and teach people from a young age how to identify and how to talk about mental illness. Um, Kind of similar as you were talking about um, how to transition out of military life and find a job. um, How do you think someone should share their story um, with their employer about um, their bipolar or different mental illness diagnosis without the possibility of losing their job? Jeannie says, there's so much negativity associated with bipolar and mental illness, and she just doesn't want to jeopardize um, her job and her livelihood. I agree with her, and um, I think she's smart. Um, you're, it's Jeannie, I, I just had a conversation, multiple conversations with uh, this new friend of mine, this, this woman who contacted me. She's a senior executive in a world-class famous organization, which I you know, won't mention what it is. And you know, she's only got a few years till retirement and she is afraid to come out and say and admit that she has bipolar. The people around her, they are kind of aware that she has something going on because she had a complete breakdown several years ago and was able to get well enough to keep working. She took all of her sick leave and just spent all of it to recover and um, and came back to work. And she performs well in her job because she's highly talented, very experienced and a hard worker. But she's worried that, you know, if I, if I come out and say, you know, I have bipolar disorder, that they may discriminate against me. They may, you know, cause me to have to lose my job. Um, and all these, you know, repercussions and bad things. And I told her, I said, find out what the rules, but she wants to come out. She wants to say, I have bipolar disorder because she wants to be a leader and help break the stigma and be a role model for younger employees, male and female, that can see her and say, wow, she's not afraid. She's successful. She's overcome bipolar. She wants to do all that, but she's worried and afraid. And I told her, I said, hey, look, uh, you know, my situation is totally different. I mean, I retired from the army as a general. I'm okay financially. I don't want to get another paying job. I, I just want to be a full-time independent mental health advocate, work with great organizations like IBPF and others. And um, so my situation is different. I can, I can afford to, you know, be quote unquote brave, um, but you got to be smart. And so Jeannie, I would say the same thing to you. Be smart. Don't do anything to harm yourself or hurt yourself um, because 
there's only one of you, and, and this is gonna take years to build into a heroic cause. And I, I would just say, it's not worth it to hurt yourself. Um, but if, if you check it out, and because there's all kinds of laws and regulations uh, about mental health, about all kinds of discrimination in the workplace. And um, you know, if, if it's safe, and there's no repercussions and it's barred legally and you feel confident that you're not going to get hurt, then I think it's good and it'll help lots of people if you tell your story and you help break the stigma. Awesome. That was a great answer to such an important question. All right. Our next question is um, from Sharish. And they asked, did the psychiatrist diagnose you with bipolar one or bipolar two? It seems like you never had a manic episode that led you to stop working because you were due. Um, and we're, Sharish was wondering um, this question. I was diagnosed with bipolar type one because when they looked at the entire history, you know, from 2003, when I went into mania in Iraq to 2014, where I rocketed into acute full-blown mania. Most of my, you know, the, the uh, bipolar experience was mania by far. Um, I did not miss work or have a breakdown due to bipolar until after I was removed from my job as president of National Defense University. So in November of 2014, remember I said I went, I went into rocketed into acute mania, was removed from NDU, the university. And then four months later, I crashed into crippling depression. At that point, I couldn't work. I, I couldn't function. I could barely get out of bed. I could barely think. I could barely carry on a coherent conversation. Uh, it was it was absolutely horrifying. It was it was awful. You know, the combination of the crippling depression and the frightening psychosis. Um, so that was the first time I couldn't work. Um, and so I, by that point, I had had bipolar disorder, you know, actively for, you know, 11 plus years. And prior to the onset of my bipolar in Iraq, I had a hyperthymic personality, the hyperthymia, which again is a mild form of baseline mania. So I literally from about junior high on until I was 47, I mean, my personality was mildly manic with probably blips into mania, but I was happy and energetic all the time until I went into high functioning mania during the Iraq war where I was kind of like Superman. And um, so I don't know if that, if that answers it, come back at me if it didn't. I think that was a good answer, but keep us posted, Shree. So our next question is, how do you think the battle against stigma is going? In your opinion, is there hope to break down these constructs and wrong ideas about mental illness? I think the battle in the fight is moving in the right direction. Um, I think what I'm seeing now, and based on my research and writing my book and these articles and everything, there are lots and lots of very, very famous people who have come out openly and said, I have bipolar disorder and here's my story, or I have severe depression, and here's my story. I mean, if you, if you Google um, famous people with mental illness, you'll be, you'll be blown away by the names of the people that pop up. Uh, you know, they're Hollywood movie stars, phenomenal writers, business leaders, um, politicians, and so on and so forth, loads and loads of people. Um, there are books written by people like Kay Redfield Jameson, famous psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. I mean, she's written about a half a dozen phenomenal books about mental illness. And you know her particular field is bipolar disorder because that's what she has. And she almost killed herself twice and she survived and it almost ruined her life. Um, when you read uh, Professor Gamey's book, A First Rate Madness, you know, he does case studies on about a dozen famous world leaders 
and he and he looks at their mental health and their mental illness situation. And these people are famous. I mentioned the presidents, Lincoln, FDR, JFK, Winston Churchill had man manic depressive illness, which we now call bipolar. Um, William Tecumseh Sherman, famous Civil War general, who basically you know broke the back of the Confederacy, bipolar disorder. And when he was in mania, he was brilliant beyond belief as a commanding general of the Union forces. Um, Ted Turner, famous businessman, bipolar disorder. Uh, there's a, there's a whole there's a movement in the National Football League where a bunch of players in the NFL have come out and said they have mental illness. There's a bunch of other pro athletes. Um, uh, Kevin Love, famous basketball player, uh, severe depression. Um, other basketball players. Uh, Ted, a number of tennis players have come out and said, I, you know, they have told their story. Michael Phelps, greatest swimmer of all time, severe depression. He started a, a foundation to work on this stuff. So as I learn, the more I learn about it, the more I'm seeing, wow, you know, there's a lot in the, the uh, woman tennis player this summer who withdrew from the big open. Um, there's lots and lots of people uh, I'm seeing. I, you know, I, I, see a lot on LinkedIn and Facebook, you know, like really accomplished people at famous universities who are on the faculties or what have you, uh, they're coming out and saying, you know, I have bipolar. So I think there is momentum building. And if, if all of us, the famous people and, and, you know, people like me and people like you in the audience, if we just, without hurting ourselves, if, you know, I don't want you to be try to be you know, a hero and then hurt yourself and lose your job. I don't wanna see that. But if we all do our part of telling our story, we will help over time, just like Betty Ford and the other women with breast cancer, we will chip away at this thing. It's probably gonna take years, it might take decades, but we will defeat the diabolical monster of stigma. Awesome, I agree and that's why in organizations like International Bipolar and all the other mental health groups out there are so important is we're putting people like you at the forefront in this fight against stigma. Um, one of the questions from Terry Cheney um, was, she wanted to first thank you for your ins sharing your inspirational story. And um, she's wondering how you feel about peer support specifically um, Major General Mark Graham's peer support group, Vets for Warriors, if you've ever heard about them. Um, how do you think peer support can help people and especially help people recovering with bipolar? Um, thanks for that great question. Uh, first off, I know Mark Graham. Uh, I served with him. He is an awesome guy. Him and his wife are phenomenal. Their book is incredible. And, you know, my heart goes out, you know, having lost two of their sons, one in combat in Iraq. Uh, the other to suicide. I mean, just a tragic story. And, you know, the, the Grahams are just such a brave couple. Uh, my hat's off to them. I think Mark has done incredible work. His foundation is fantastic. Um, everything about it is good. It, I think it's a model. I think peer support is incredibly uh, important for all the reasons that I said previously in earlier questions and during my talk. I think there is something extremely powerful about human connection and the peer level support is more powerful because the people are peers and there's no fear, there's no hesitancy, there's no intimidation to tell it like it is. You know, one of the things that happens in the military and it's same in civilian life is you, as you go up higher and higher in rank and clearly by the time you become a colonel or a general, people don't wanna tell you the truth because it's too painful or they're afraid or they think they'll get in trouble. So they sugarcoat everything and they, they put varnish on the ugly truth. And so that's just proof you need a peer. You need someone who's not afraid to tell you the truth and that nothing bad's gonna happen to them for telling you the truth. So, and then the peer to peer you develop also not only a relationship, but I think again, it builds hope and connection and strength. You know, it's like it's their links in the chain of support and their strong links. Um, jumping from Mark Graham and what he's done, 
uh, I've, we've got a little group called the Mental Wellness Warriors, and they're all people who have either reached out to me because of an article or something, a speech I gave, or they're people who um, live in Cocoa Beach, where I've got this incredible, vibrant base of supporters that are mostly friends uh, from the gym, you know, and at this dancing class I take. I was actually in a dancing show last spring, <laughs> so much fun. And, um, and so I shared my story in Cocoa Beach and had articles in the local paper and stuff like that. And uh, so that's my base. So those are peers of, of mine that I love to work with. And one of the women who's in our mental wellness warriors, she lives in Buffalo, New York, and she's a therapist, social worker for the first responders in the city of Buffalo. So police officers, firemen, EMTs. And she has been one of the prime engines in peer-to-peer -peer support in Buffalo. And then Buffalo became like a uh, best practice and it spread all through New York state. In fact, she's gonna get a big award from uh, Westchester County, which is all the way in the Eastern part of New York by New York City. And, and they're gonna give her like the, you know, therapist worker of the year because she took and trained all the people in Westchester County, how to do this peer-to-peer -peer support. So it, that just is another example. And she gave a little presentation to our mental wellness warriors about a month ago and told everybody about it. So I'm a huge supporter of peer support. And you know, an example, it doesn't have to be some big program thing. A number of these people who have reached out to me, that's, that's a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. You know, because I'm retired now. So a, 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 a private or a sergeant or a captain, I tell them, don't call me, sir. Don't call me general. Just call me Greg. And let's talk. About it. And I'll be your friend. I'll be your, you know, peer to peer support person. This the just another example that could give you dozens. But the woman who reached out to me, the executive, I told her, I said, you know, we are a peer to peer support relationship. We'll probably never meet each other in person, but we can you know, talk over email or text. We can talk on the telephone. Um, you all, I've already you know, gotten so much encouragement from talking to you, I told her, um, that it's already helped me because I have more hope because we have a peer to peer relationship. And then she said, yeah, I mean, it's really helped me a lot. All your experiences, you've answered all these questions that I've been afraid to ask. And so, that was just like a, uh, um, an informal, spontaneous friendship that just developed uh, over the computer. That is so awesome. Just That just shows how great either social media or just how we've gone all virtual and can have webinars like this, how it just fosters connection and that fosters hope. And that's really what's gonna get us through. It's the most powerful tool. And kind of jumping off from there, what do you think has been the most powerful resource or support in your road to recovery that's brought you the most hope um, throughout your hardest battles? That's a great question. Um, who boy, uh, there's a few things. Um, you know, my wife and family, sticking with me, never quitting, never turning against me, which so many people don't have that blessing. So they were huge. Number two, uh, my battle buddy from the army, he was a retired Colonel Medical Corps with a lot of experience in mental health. He never quit. He stayed with me. He stuck with me. Even when I was so depressed and I never answered phone calls, I didn't answer texts, he would get a hold of my wife who knew him. And he fought and fought to stay engaged with me when I thought my life was over. And um, he talked to experts, you know, up in the New Hampshire, Vermont, New England area, and he found out what he thought was the best VA to go to or best medical treatment, because I was close to Dartmouth University Medical Center. And based on his research and talking to his expert friends, psychiatrists, they came to the conclusion that the White River Junction Vermont Veterans Affairs Hospital was probably the best psychiatric facility I could go to in the Northeast, in the like multiple state area, even better than the great civilian hospitals. And the reason for that was first off, they just, they're a great, department, the psychiatry department, but the VA is expert in combat trauma, war-related stuff, 
dealing with military people. So I would say, you know, my wife and family, my battle buddy, which again, peer support, that guy, that guy, Bill Barco, my buddy, he was a peer, we had a peer support thing going on. And then thirdly, I would say the VA. I mean, the VA, and they get a lot of bad press and a lot of bad rap, and I understand it. I, I, I understand it. The VA has a lot of problems they're dealing with and trying to overcome, and they're working hard on that. But in terms, if, if for me, once I was able to get my foot in the door, the doctors, the nurses, the therapists, the chaplain, they were world-class. I mean, they couldn't be better. And they were so caring and um, encouraging. So I would say um, the VA has been huge. And the VA down here in Florida is also really, really good. I would say that the miracle medic medication of lithium, lithium is, a, is one of the older medications for bipolar disorder or what they used to call manic depressive illness. But it is, it is tried and true, the most powerful mood stabilizer for lots of people. And the, 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 um, the lithium just turned me around. It was, it turned me around. And then coming down here in Florida, the bright, sunny, warm palm trees, you know, laid back culture, happy atmosphere, that's been huge. And then doing fun, happy, enjoyable things. Like I love to dance. I love going to the gym. I love to run on the beach. I love music, you know, my favorite music. And, um, and being healthy, good diet, plenty of sleep, low stress. And I really have learned to avoid stress or situations or people that make me agitated, anxious, or angry. So those are all, all things that I would hit on as my major factors. Awesome. Here's one last fun question. What is your favorite song to dance to? My favorite song to dance to? Yeah. Okay. Oh my God, this class I take, it's called Gotta Dance. The instructor was a choreographer, professional dancer. It's all great, like rock and roll, modern stuff like that. So, and she introduces new songs, like every, you know, every week or month is new songs. But right now I would say the songs that make me the happiest, I'll give three. Um, uh, Sia, the group Sia, S-I-A, Cheap Thrills. Oh my God, that is so much fun. And me and this other woman who's this phenomenal athlete, I mean, she can leap like Michael Jordan and we dance together and we are like off, she's like off flying through the air and I try to keep up with her. But I love, I love that song. I love Dance Monkey. Oh, it is so much fun. And like everybody's dancing and singing. It's like a big party at the gym. That's another one I love. Uh, Dancing Queen, because it's another one of these uh, dances where we're leaping across the floor. Um, and then another one that I absolutely have fallen in love with is uh, Simply the Best. Yes. So and then I could go on, but those are the ones that just, the, the, the second I hear the first note of any one of those songs, I mean, I get a surge of dopamine, endorphins, and I'm, I'm blipping into like low level mania. And then being with my friends, you know, I call them the gutta dance girls. They're so much fun. And, you know, I'm like the only guy in the class, but these women are just so fun to be around. You know, they're mostly in their sixties and a whole bunch of them are great dancers, super athletes. They're fun, they're happy. They all know I have bipolar and, and they think it's awesome like that I'm telling my story. Oh, that's so awesome. I'm so glad you have that ex place to go and let it all out and just have the best time ever. And I, I wish we could all join you in that dance class. <laughs> Me too. Hey, come to Cocoa Beach. Okay, if we're ever out there, we're all joining Greg's dance class, everyone. That sounds good. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. And I just wanna say thank you to everyone who joined our webinar today. I sincerely hope you all enjoyed our conversation with Major General Greg Martin. So let's give him a big virtual round of applause. And I think I speak for everyone when I say thank you so much, Greg, for your service, sharing your story, and being here with us today.
Well, Micah, it's, it's absolutely an honor and a privilege. And to everybody out in the audience, I wish I could see you and meet you and we could talk in person. But I just want to put in a plug for the International Bipolar Foundation. Wonderful organization. They read some of my articles. They reached out and we're developing a fantastic relationship. Micah is delightful to work with and a super professional, great at her job. And um, they actually invited me to do a, th a short three minute video that they used uh, as part of their gala fundraiser last week. And I would just invite everybody to consider um, consider donating to the IBPF um, it, because they're all they're a nonprofit and they're always trying to raise raise funds. But just consider it. And um, and then the last thing I would just say is if you want to dialogue more, uh, Micah's got my contact info. And if you want to, all my articles are in a bunch of talks are on um, at my website www general greg martin all one word g e n e r a l g r e g g m a r t i n dot com so feel free to contact me and uh love to meet all of you thanks micah awesome thank you guys so much